Hi everybody, my name is Maddie Allen. I'm a final year PhD student with Brunel University and I'm sponsored by the Lloyds Register Foundation. I'm going to speak to you today about my PhD topic, which is the prediction of microstructure within metal additively manufactured parts. So I'm going to start by just giving you a brief overview of what additive manufacturing is and why we're interested in it. And then move on to giving you a bit more detail about the project itself and what we aim to do within this work. And then give you an outline of three validation studies that have been undertaken within this work. So what is additive manufacturing? I'll give a brief overview for those of you who aren't familiar with the topic. So additive manufacturing is a method of production where we create parts by depositing material layer upon layer to create the final geometry, as opposed to taking away excess material. It can offer a wide range of benefits for industry, including things such as customization opportunities, and the development of complex geometries, such as lattice structures that wouldn't be able to be made using casting or subtractive techniques, and also waste reduction opportunities as we're only delivering the material that we require. However, the implementation of additive manufacturing within industry is limited by a number of challenges, and these range from things such as manufacturing constraints, including build chamber size, and also deposition rate, to more physical flaws such as porosity, lack of fusion or surface, rough surface finishes, as well as residual stress and distortion that are caused by the cyclical rapid heating and cooling in the process. However, the biggest problem that we see in additive manufacturing is the reliability and repeatability and how we can be certain that this part has the properties that are required for its purpose. One way we can achieve this understanding of a part's properties is by looking at the links between process parameters, resultant microstructure and material properties. It is well known that a part's material properties are determined by the underlying microstructure, which in turn is determined by the thermal history that the material has been exposed to. This project focuses on the first link between process parameters and microstructure and how we can use numerical modelling as an efficient tool to simulate and predict microstructure development and look at how process parameters can affect this. Overall, this work aims to increase understanding and reliability in additively manufactured parts. It is a step towards seeing the eventual widespread implementation of additive manufacturing in industry, allowing us to benefit from the potential that this process has to offer. For example, Boeing flew its first plane with an engine made of additively manufactured components earlier this year. And not only does this offer an opportunity for reduction in raw material costs, but if we could use additive manufacturing techniques to optimise components and reduce the weight of a part, a reduction of 100 kilograms would lead to a saving of $2.5 million in fuel and 1.3 megatons of CO2 emissions over a plane's lifetime. So you can see the scale of economical and environmental benefits that this process has to offer. But how do we go about this? So I'm going to focus on now telling you a little bit more about the modelling approach itself within the project. And this is done using a finite element, cellular automata coupling. So what we do first is we develop a 3D finite element thermal model that's representative of the additive manufacturing process. And once we have this accurate thermal history, we import it into the cellular automata model, which is used to simulate grain growth. And now we normally do this on a 2D cross section. And this gives us a visual representation of what we would expect the resultant microstructure to look like that we can then compare to experimental EBSD and SEM images. Here I'll explain a little about cellular automata itself and then going to explain how we can use these techniques to model grain growth. So cellular automata is a modeling technique that makes use of a grid of cells where each cell is assigned a number of variables and a set of rules that determines how these variables are updated and changed. You may have heard of James Conway's Game of Life, and that's a very famous example of a cellular automata model. So I've got a basic example for you here. If I start with a grid of cells and I say the variable I'm interested in is whether a cell is pink or blue, and I'm given the rule that if a blue cell has a pink neighbour, then the cell is updated to be pink. If I start with the scenario on the left hand side, where all of the cells are blue except the centre cell, which is pink, after one cellular automata step, I would obtain the result on the right hand side, and as you can see, all of the pink cells' neighbours 
have also become pink. So in order to use these techniques to model grain growth, we need to make sure that the state variables and the rules that we use to update them are representative of physical solidification laws. So we have five of the main rules here. So the top two are melting rules. So the first rule basically says, if I have a cell that is above liquidus temperature, it becomes a liquid cell. And then the second says, if I am a solid cell, but I have a liquid neighbour, I become a growing cell because I now have room in my neighbourhood to grow into. The third rule is a nucleation rule, and this just allows for probabilistic nucleation in the model using a Gaussian distribution. And then the bottom two are solidification rules. Now, the first of these two is how we represent crystal growth. And we do this by defining a growth envelope. So you can see a 2D example in the bottom right hand corner here. And we use a square to represent the, the growth envelope in this model, as it is the 2D projection of both an octahedral FCC structure and a cubic BCC structure. If we should model this in 3D, we would model an octahedron for an FCC crystal and a cube for a BCC crystal. So what this rule actually says is, is that if I'm a liquid cell and I get caught within this growth envelope of a neighbouring cell, I become part of that crystal and I take on the same orientation. And this is how we represent crystal growth within the model. And the final rule just says that if I am a growing cell, but I no longer have any liquid neighbours, I become a fully solid cell. Here we have a 3D casting application. So you can see how we start with the random nucleation and then the grains grow and evolve to fill the full volume. Now this was done using a 3D FCC octahedral growth mechanism. In order to test how accurately we can predict microstructure using this modelling approach, we undertook a validation study using open source experimental data that had been made available as part of the NIST Additive Manufacturing Benchmark in 2018. And what they did as part of this particular challenge was they performed 10 laser scans on a bare Inconel 625 substrate using three different sets of process parameters. And for each scan, they measured extensively the cooling rate the melt pool geometry and also EBSD maps and SEM images were made available of the resultant microstructure, as you can see above. The first step within this study was to create the thermal model, and we did this using a 3D finite element model representative of the laser scan in the bare Inconel 625 substrate. This was calibrated so that all of the melt pool dimensions were in within one coefficient of variation of those seen experimentally, and the cooling rate obtained was of the same order of magnitude of the experimental. This was then used to simulate the grain growth within the melt pool of a 2D cross section perpendicular to the scanning direction. So you can see this in the top right hand corner animation. As you can see in the bottom corner, a good visual agreement was achieved between the NIST EBSD results and the simulated microstructure. And they both show strong elongated grains in the direction of the thermal gradient within the melt pool. Both the EBSD and the simulated microstructure were both analysed using a minimum bounding ellipse method to give a quantitative comparison. And again, you can see in the results here that the area, the length and the aspect ratio of the grains were all within one coefficient of variation of those achieved experimentally. So we can agree from this that the modelling approach does in fact give quite an accurate representation of the ex expected microstructure. There is, however, some probabilistic aspect in this model. So, for example, the initial substrate microstructure in the simulation you saw in the previous slide is generated randomly, so we have no control of the grain orientations or positions. So I wanted to investigate how these probabilistic aspects were affecting the resultant microstructures that we were obtaining. So I undertook a statistical analysis of the model and I ran a total of 25 models until we saw that the standard deviation of the grain measures across all of the runs was beginning to stabilise, as you can see in the graph. I then looked at the average grain size and dimensions across all of the 25 models. And as you can see in the results in the bottom right corner, there was a decrease in percentage error between the average grain dimensions over the 25 runs and the experimental values than previously when we were only considering a single model. Also, I also identified the best green simulation which was extremely close to the experimental values. 
And what we can learn from this is that it is an important factor for us to run multiple simulations to account for probabilistic aspects and achieve the most reliable results. The next stage in this project is to apply the model to a more complex additive manufacturing process. For this we're using a direct energy deposition method called laser metal deposition and we're looking at a number of Inconel 718 samples with a simple wall geometry varying travel speed, feed rate and nozzle gas flow. The thermal history of a number of these samples will also be recorded so that we can use this data for thermal calibrations. This is the initial modelling setup for the thermal models. So we have the 304 stainless steel fixture with the 316L stainless steel substrate on top, the deposited wall in Inconel 718 on top of that. You can also see that the thermocouple placement has been replicated within the model so that we can compare the data with the experimental results. For these models, there are a number of factors that we need to consider in order to accurately represent the process. So we're modelling the laser by using a conical Gaussian body flux and we're looking at using a combination of element birth and quiet element techniques to model the material deposition in the process. We're also looking at a force convection model to represent the effects of the nozzle gas flow and we're looking at computational efficiency techniques so that we can achieve a fine scale model within the region of interest while still being able to model the full deposition process. Unfortunately, due to the outbreak of COVID-19 and other unforeseen complications, the work on this laser metal deposition study is slightly behind schedule. However, we do now have a calibrated thermal model and plans are in progress to look at and model the microstructure on all three 2D cross sections to give an overall 3D effect of how the process parameters are affecting the resultant microstructure. The final study within this project looks at functionally graded materials. So additive manufacturing offers the added benefit of being able to look at materials by design. And this means we can optimise the material properties of a material by tailoring the microstructure. And we can do this by using an in-situ change of process parameters. And this can be seen in the experimental work of Popovich et al. Within the experimental work, they took two sets of process parameters and built a powder bed fusion sample by alternating between the two sets. And the results show that upon changing process parameter, a fine to cast microstructure transition was seen. So here we have used the microstructure modeling techniques to try and model the same phenomena. So we've taken a reduced domain 2D model of the cross section in the build direction and modelled a number of section 1 layers followed by a number of section 2 layers. The model accounts for nucleation from the boundary to the powder and also the alternating scanning strategy and you can see in the simulation and the results shown here that we also obtain a clear transition in microstructure. So what can we conclude from all of this? So far within my PhD I have successfully implemented and used a coupled cellular automata and finite element modelling approach that has achieved good quantitative and qualitative agreement with experimental results. We have also investigated the probabilistic aspects of the model and how these influence results. Work is currently undergoing to validate the application to more complex additive manufacturing processes, as well as determining the capability of the modelling approach to predict differences in microstructure due to alterations in process parameters. And the model has also been successfully used to predict a microstructural transition due to in situ process parameter changes. Finally, the work remaining for me to finish is the completion of the study on the direct energy deposition processes and to complete my thesis writing. To conclude, I'd like to thank my supervisors, the Lloyds Register Foundation and everybody at NSERC. And thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. All of my details are below.